Major funding for Growing Up Gay has been provided by the Gill Foundation. I was asked a few years ago, Brian, when did you choose to be gay? And I said, oh, that day I decided to be condemned by the church, kicked out of my family, fired from my job. I thought it'd be fun. Where do, where do heterosexual people come up with the idea that gay people somehow as teenagers sat in their room and uh, try to think of the worst thing they could possibly come down and announce to their parents. <laughs> hey, mom and dad, I think I'm gay. <laughs> and the parents' response is always, you know, well, why are you doing this to me? The, 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 there is no heterosexual person who remembers sitting in his or her room with a pad of paper divided down the center with gay and straight coming up with all the advantages of being one or the other and deciding that, gee, I think I'll be a heterosexual. Heterosexual people have known ever since they were little that they were attracted to people of the other sex. Gay and lesbian people have known ever since we were little that we were attracted to people of the same sex. But we grew up in a culture that told us repeatedly that this is unacceptable. So even though we couldn't change our feelings, we felt guilty and ashamed and frightened by them. We gay kids learned to lie at a very early age. I remember being 10, 11 years old, real frightened by my feelings, terrified of who do you tell, you know? Who do you tell? I mean, you grow up in a family in which maybe you've seen your dad laugh at a fag joke that the DJ on the radio told. Or maybe you're sitting there watching television and Donahue has on a gay guest and your mom walks over and changes the channel. Or maybe your older brother or sister comes home from college and calls you a fag or wears a fag buster sweatshirt on. And at 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, you decide you can't tell anybody. And I experienced the oppression of being a basketball player in a locker room in which kids told fag jokes. And I experienced the oppression of being someone who was voted unanimously by the faculty of his all-boys Catholic prep school, the John Stewart Christian Leadership Award. And when I came out eight years later, my name was taken off the plaque. People didn't know whether I had had sex or not, but just saying that I was gay was enough for somebody to take my name off the plaque. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm real excited that you're here. And, and I know that this is a topic that for many of you is something near and dear to your heart, the topic of gay people and what it's like to grow up as a gay person. Some of you are parents of gay men and lesbian women. And some of you are brothers or sisters or a dear friend. Some of you are gay people yourselves. And you're giving a beautiful face to this topic tonight. As many of you know, I've spent about 20 years of my life talking about homosexuality primarily to heterosexual audiences. And what I have found in the work that I have done in colleges and most recently in corporations is that most heterosexual people don't really understand what this is all about. And in today's society, as you know, they're being asked to respond, and I think without an awful lot of information. They're being asked to respond to the topic of gay people in the military. Should gay people be serving in the military as openly gay people? Should gay people march in St. Patrick's Day parades? How do I vote on gay rights? Should I support it, or is this special rights for people? Is being gay the same as being black or Latino or Native American or Asian? Are they the same, or are they very different? What about gay people maintaining custody of their children? That's a, a topic that came up not long ago in the press. And when people are asked to respond to this, they feel frustrated because they don't know. No one has ever talked to them about homosexuality. And so I feel patience with the uh, people who don't, don't understand because I know that they've never had the opportunity. What we're going to try to do tonight is raise people's information level a little bit and lower people's anxiety. I have a basic theory about this. I believe that a lot of people feel uncomfortable with this topic because they, have, they, they operate out of a position of ignorance. Personally, I believe that ignorance or lack of exposure to a topic is the parent of fear. I think most of us in our lives are afraid of the things that we don't understand. 
Have you ever been to a foreign country and not known the language and not known the monetary system and it's time to order from the menu and you don't know what you're doing? Your anxiety is pretty high because you don't have any information. And I think that's true today, too. People don't understand, do gay people choose to be gay? You know, are gay boys boys who wish they were girls? Because that's what people say. S the words like sissy and pansy and fairy, those are all feminine terms, and it reinforces people's stereotypes that gay kids are confused. Uh, when does somebody know that they're gay? Because people don't know answers to these questions, they feel the same sort of anxiety that you and I do when we're around people who are different than us. And so, ignorance is the parent of fear, and fear is the parent of hatred. I think often people hate what, what they're afraid of. This has certainly been true in my life. If I can just give you one example of that. When I was a kid, my father, who for many years worked in the General Motors Public Relations Department, he taught every boy in our family how to shake hands. This was an important male bonding experience. And I was an accomplished handshaker. I was a very good handshaker until I met somebody who was blind. And I didn't know what to do when I met the blind person because Dad didn't cover it. My anxiety was high about that. Do you leave your hand out there for them to find? You know, do you reach down? And how long do you wait? You know, do you reach down and take their hand and have them pull back? That was my fear that they'd say, well, what are you touching me for? So I avoided the person because I didn't know what to do. And you know what? I was a little angry with the person for being blind because if they hadn't been blind, I wouldn't have been uncomfortable, right? I think sometimes we blame the victim. You know, if you weren't poor, I wouldn't feel guilty, so do something. <laughs> you know? We blame the victim. I think this is true, too, on the subject of homosexuality. People get angry at gay people because they don't understand. They don't know what language to use. I was a speaker at a conference one time. It was a wonderful conference. I was a speaker, and there was a blind person who was a speaker, and a woman, and a Latino, and an African American, and a Native American, and a Jewish person. It was one of those conferences where at the end you want to join hands and sing Kumbaya, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I sat next to the blind person at the dinner table, and I said to this blind person, I have a, a really dumb question for you, I know. But he said, what's that? And I said, I don't know what to do when I meet somebody who's blind. I'd, I'd like to shake your hand. And he said, well, Brian, that's a wonderful question. If sighted people only ask those kind of questions, I wouldn't feel so isolated. See, I think gay, lesbian, and bisexual people feel isolated because people are afraid to ask questions. He said, take my hand. He said, tell me you're about to take it. He said, some blind people will lift their hand, but just tell me you're about to take my hand. And so I did. I said, I'm about to take your hand. And I shook his hand. And I said, you want another dumb question? He said, sure. I said, would you like to know what we're having for dinner? And, uh, he said, good question. He said, and if you tell me where things are on the plate, think of my plate as a clock and tell me where things are according to the time of day. He said, then I can find the food myself and I'll be comfortable. So I started looking for blind people to introduce myself to because I felt that I knew what I was doing. What I hope will happen tonight with this time that we have together is that we can lower anxiety so that people can ask questions because that's what's separating us from one another in all these issues, race and gender and religion and sexual orientation is our anxiety created by our lack of exposure to the topic makes us afraid. So why are people afraid? Because they've never had the opportunity to learn about this, right? Uh, how many of you, and I know that this is a, a self-selected group, but how many of you, when you were growing up, had a book on your shelf at home that talked about homosexuality? I don't mean mentioned it, but explained it to you. You know, when you were growing up, if you grew up in this culture, you heard words like fairy and sissy and pansy and homo and queer and punk. You heard those words, right? Well, if you wanted to go home and, and pull a book off the shelf that explained to you who these people were. Did any of you have a book at home that explained? I didn't either. I had the dictionary. And, I, and I'm a little kid who's aware that I have feelings that aren't consistent with the feelings of my male friends. I'm different than they are. And I went home to try to figure out. And I was afraid to tell anybody. Right? So there was no book on my shelf at home either. And, and did any of us have a book in our high school library about it? Me neither. <laughs> Um, or, a, or a pamphlet in the rack outside of the guidance office. No. Most of us learned about homosexuality by laughing at a joke that a kid told, right? Seeing graffiti on a bathroom wall, listening to kids use derogatory language on the playground, watching a movie, and, and in all the movies you're going to see, if you look back, you know, I'm 45, you know, look at the movies that came out when I was growing up. Gay people were always presented as pretty bizarre, 
unhappy individuals. That's what most Americans got as their education about this topic. And so they feel anxious. We're asking them to now vote on something or, or be a friend to a gay person or hear their child tell them that they're gay or lesbian. And they think, please give us some information because we don't understand. Not only did we not get any education on homosexuality, we didn't get much on heterosexuality either, did we? According to Gallup, less than about 10% of us say that we felt we got good sex education in high school. How many of you feel you got a good sex education in high school? <laughs> Me neither. I went to an all-boys Catholic prep school taught by the Christian Brothers of Ireland, and we had a half an hour film from the Navy on gonorrhea. That was it. <laughs> there was no discussion. And less than 15% of us say that we got a good sexuality education in our homes, that we felt that our parents talked to us in a way that we felt real comfortable. How many people feel you got a good sexuality education at home? I'm the middle child of seven Irish Catholics. We said somebody was in a family way. We didn't say somebody was pregnant. You didn't talk about sex in my house. And most of us were off on our own trying to learn and trying to act sophisticated. But in truth, a lot of us walked around and still do not knowing. And so what I want to talk, to, to talk with us tonight about is who are gay people? When I say that I'm gay, what am I telling you about myself? Sometimes people will say, well, why do you have to tell me that you're gay? I don't tell, you what I, I don't tell people what I do with my wife. No, why do you have to tell me what you do? Is that what I'm telling you when I tell you that I'm gay? That's what some people think, that when I say that I'm gay, they, want, they think that I want to talk about my sexual behavior. In 20 years, I've never talked to an audience about my sexual behavior. I'm a certified sexuality educator, and I talk about sexuality in general. But when I tell you that I'm gay, I'm telling you who I am. I'm telling you where I've been. I'm telling you the feelings that I've had ever since I was a child. Whether or not I ever act on those feelings, I'm still gay. See, we're going we're gonna to make distinctions tonight between sexual orientation, which is what we all feel inside. We all have a sexual orientation. Some of us are oriented towards people of the same gender, and we call that homosexual orientation. Some of us are oriented towards both genders, not necessarily equally, but we have attractions for both genders, and we call that bisexual sexual orientation. And some of us are attracted towards people of the other gender, and we call that heterosexual orientation. How many people have this orientation for people of the same sex? Well, there's a lot of debate about that, isn't it? You've seen all kinds of figures. I continue to use the 10% figure because I believe that about 10% of the population have these internal feelings of attraction whether or not they act on those feelings. And whether or not I act on those feelings, I'm still a gay person, right? And I can still be fired in 42 of the 50 states solely for my internal feelings of attraction, regardless of how I behave. That's sexual orientation. Well, where does it come from? What we believe, and I say we, I'm talking about most people in the field of sexuality education, believes that no one chooses their sexual orientation. See, sexual orientation is different than sexual behavior. Sexual behavior is what I do. And sometimes I act in accordance with my sexual orientation, and sometimes I don't because I'm afraid. Some homosexually oriented people marry a heterosexual person because they're afraid. And sexual identity is what I call myself. I tell you that I'm gay. For a long period of my life, I wasn't able to tell you that I was gay, so my orientation was different than my identity. Do you follow what I'm saying? So there are a, a study that came out last year from the Guttmacher Institute said that 1% of the people that they interviewed said that they were gay. Well, that's very different than the number of people who actually are. So I'm going to use the 10% figure. You use whatever figure you're comfortable with. But I'm going to suggest about 10% of us have an orientation. And we didn't choose our orientation any more than a heterosexual person did. A television talk show host asked me one time, he said, Brian, when did you decide to be gay? <laughs> and I said, oh, that day I decided to be condemned by the church, kicked out of my family, fired from my job. I thought it'd be fun. <laughs> what, what are people thinking when they ask this question? Are they thinking that children are sitting in their rooms all day trying to think of the worst thing they can tell their parents? What, what are they imagining? Heterosexual people know that they didn't choose to be heterosexual. I've never met a heterosexual man who said, well, I knew that you know, I could be gay, but I decided not to be. I decided to be heterosexual. They never say that. But sometimes, because no one gave them any information, they think that maybe I did at 17 think it was going to be fun to be gay. And that's not the truth. The truth is that I had feelings at a very early age, like most gay, lesbian, and bisexual people I know. I knew that I was different. 
I didn't know what that meant, but I knew that I wasn't the same. And if you had asked me as a child, are you gay, I would have said, oh, gosh, no, please don't use that word. I would have been angry. Those were fighting words because those are the worst things you can call a little kid today. Don't call a little boy a faggot or a fairy or a sissy or a pansy, right? Don't call a little girl a dyke because that's the worst thing you can call me. But I knew that I was different. Now, why was I different? Well, the research that we have suggests that probably sexual orientation for all of us, gay, straight, or bisexual, results from a combination of factors. It's probably true that homosexuality has existed in every species of mammal. We know that from a study that was done by Ford and Beach, an anthropologist and zoologist in the, in the 1950s. So homosexual behavior exists in every species of mammal. And anthropologists tell us it exists all over the world, right? So where are all these people coming from? Well, we think a combination of factors, probably some genetic influencing. I think you probably saw a recent study that said that they think they've isolated a section of the X chromosome in a child, in a homosexual child, where it's, they, they've actually been able to show that this person had the exact same genetic makeup as his gay brother did. That's startling to geneticists to see that there's the exact same genetic makeup. They believe that it's genetic because if I'm a gay person and you're my identical twin, according to one study that was done, 52% of the time you'll be gay too. And if I'm gay and you're my fraternal twin, which means that we have a different egg now, we have two eggs rather than one that's split, 22% of the time you'll be gay. So the further we move away from the genetic link, the further, the lower the incidence is of homosexuality. And if I'm gay and you were adopted, 11% of the time you'll be gay. That's fascinating, don't you think? It shows a real, it shows a lot of influence of genetics, at least the studies that we have so far. Hormones also influence us. You know that when we're fetuses, we get hormones from our mothers. Testosterone and estrogen are the hormones, and it sexualizes our brains. That, we believe, is also affecting sexual orientation. What did I get from my mother, and at what time? We know that there are brain differences. The Salk Institute study showed that in the cluster of cells in the hypothalamus, gay men have a, small, a slightly smaller section in the hypothalamus, the cluster of cells, than heterosexual men do. But a study that was done at UCLA showed that the cluster of cells between the right and left lobes of the brain was larger in gay men than it was in heterosexual men. So we're seeing some biological differences. Do the parents of gay people create homosexuality? No one's shown that there's any family dynamic that influences the development of children to be either gay, straight, or bisexual. If we knew what caused sexual orientation, if I knew how to tell you how to make sure your children would be heterosexual, I would be very rich, wouldn't I? Oh, yes, my book would be translated into every language in the world. If I could write a book that guaranteed parents how to make sure your children are heterosexual, you know there would be a pamphlet that you wrote to Pueblo, Colorado for. But no one knows. And yet, the parents of heterosexual people take pride in the fact that their kids are heterosexual, and the parents of gay people sometimes have, sh have shame about it. And they think, what did I do wrong? And, and every report we have out says you didn't do anything wrong. We don't know what causes sexual orientation, but we believe it's really beyond the control of the parent. And we believe that if it's not set by birth, then it's certainly set by no later than age five. Do you know at age five that you're gay? No. I knew at a really early age, but the mean age of recognition for boys in our culture of sexual feelings, whether you're heterosexual, homosexual, or bisexual, is 13. If you knew younger than that, that's okay, and if you knew older than that, that's okay too, but 13 seems to be the mean age according to a couple university studies. And women, for some reason, know a little bit later than that, about 15 to 17, in terms of what am I attracted to. So most of us knew it.